let's do this. Oh, what you call it? I'm not in the mood to play music. We just got here. Good to see you. Hey, you niece. Shout out to the UK. Can we give a shout out to the fact that today is the last day of the fast? <clears throat> I don't know about y'all. Thank you. But I'm, uh, I'm excited about it. I'm grateful to God that it's gone the way. We don't have to sit here in silence. Hey, Daisha. I'm so grateful to God. I'm a water faster. I don't like talking in the music plan. I gotta lower it. I'll start hearing it. I'm a water faster. So, but here you are. I'm here, Daisha, and you're here too. Glory be to God. Isn't it good? Um, so by me being a water faster, I love you, Naomi. I thought this, this fast was going to be super easy. And it was until it wasn't. I found that it got complicated, man. And I don't even know. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. I want to do a hot conversations type thing and talk about fasting. <clears throat> because it was a little bit challenging, especially for the first time. Let me move some stuff around for y'all for a little bit. Um, it was my first time. Uh, uh, what, what do you call it? Okay, that was just me. It was interesting for sure. I'm like, this is supposed to be easy. But it's never easy, you know? And so um, what happened was, I don't even know what I'm saying anymore. What what did I say? The I word I used. Um, I don't know, whatever. Doing the fast, running the fast. It just didn't, um, I'm happy he logged on for the devotional not enough today. I, um, overseeing it, whatever, it was a little complicated. Like, um, it's so important to have people because um, I was just like, I, I don't know. I just can't do this. I'm over here baby, trying to pray for myself, pray for everybody. I got to do these devotionals and these prayers. It just be a whole lot. <laughs> so it's like, especially off a of whim. I did all of that. Hey, Maddie, I did all of that in seven days. Like every day I was doing this. The fast was never planned. So shout out to God for being who he is and giving me everything that I needed because I was really seeking him. Like, Lord, listen, you told me to do this fast. So God, you got to give me what to give these people because I'm not about to go on Google. I'm not that type of person. It's got to come from you. And if, and if I ain't got it, I ain't got it. And so it was very challenging for sure. Um, but we're going to be talking about worshiping idols today. We've got two minutes, and I, I kind of want to get started early. I should probably stop coming on early because I, I'll be giving people a chance to catch up. But I'm kind of ready to go. Um, this is kind of a heavy topic for sure because I think all of us are worshiping idols. Hey, Maddie. Shout out to you for letting me use you. Shout out to all of you guys. 
every single person who went on this fast with me, who stuck with me, everyone who stayed with me. Shout out to my Discord community, which is now called Ascension. I don't know what we're going to do about a domain because I've been trying to get the Ascension domain for years. They don't have it for sale, but it's a community for going higher, rising higher together. Um, if you want to join that community, you can click on the Discord in my bio um, to connect with like-minded individuals, people of faith, people of focus, people who are aimed at something better so you don't have to walk this thing called life out by yourself. But I come to find that all of us are worshiping idols. I'm purposely waiting for one minute because something pops up on, at the top of my screen that blocks and stuff. So I'm waiting, but God is good. Can we start there? We're going to open up with prayer first before we do anything. We're going to start with prayer and we're going to go there forever. Um, I love everyone who's connected to me. And my prayer is always to see people become the best version of themselves. And, you know, have a blessed week. I'm sending love to you too, Strong Complex. I just pray that people get to that place of being their best self. But even as I'm, I'm intentional about building people up, to think in those type of ways, to make those type of decisions, to be equipped to stand in those type of positions. I do not want people worshiping idols. I feel like all of us in some way, shape or form have gotten into a place. And if I'm probably, I'm gonna try to be a little bit quieter today so I don't start coughing. Um, happy Sunday, Casey. All of us are subconsciously worshiping idols. I had a conversation with God and he revealed to me, I'm worshiping idols. So I'm like, oh my gosh. And it's not in the way that we so see. Worshiping idols can be in so many different ways. And so we're going to unpack that on today. And I pray that as you depart from this live, when the departure happens, that you will all be well. Oh, Father, in the name of Jesus, I love you. God, I thank you for this moment and these people. I thank you for our faith that connects us all. I thank you for the sanctity of this moment, for the sensitivity of this moment. Why I'm in it, I don't know, but I thank you. God, if you put me here, you've got to show up or else I'm never doing it again. I will never, ever do this again if you do not show up in this life. I will put it down. I will to roll all my notes away and I'll never touch it. I'll just end up being your child sitting on a shelf. I won't do nothing with that. I'll just worship you and praise you by my lonesome. But God, if I be at the right place, in the right place, at the right time, in the right posture, God, let your glory be shown in this life. Let every person come not to be entertained, but to be impacted, encouraged, expanded, oh God, empowered. Let them leave better than they came, oh God. Let even I get something out of your glory, oh Father, I thank you because I already believe that it's already done. Part of me is like, Lord, you got to show up in this moment. Part of me already knows that you're going to show up in the moment, God, but you did not tell me to seek you in vain. So Father, I pray against nerves. I pray against anxiety and confusion confusion, distractions, and every manipulative attack of the enemy to try to stop me from opening my mouth that you might say what needs to be said. For you said that whom you send speaks your word, oh God, for you don't give your spirit in measure. So Father, I thank you for your abundance. I thank you for your completeness, Father. I pray that you will open our minds to hear you clearly, our hearts to receive you dearly, oh God, that we might be strengthened to endure everything the enemy is trying to throw at us in this season and for eternity. God, I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We're here. Hallelujah. I feel like all of us are in some way worshiping idols. Comments are hidden for a moment. All of us in some way are worshiping idols. We have made success an idol. We have made marriage an idol. We've made material things an idol. We've made even a certain place of happiness an idol. We've reduced ourselves to serving God only for what he does. And when he doesn't seem to do what we are expecting him to do, we lose our faith as if faith was meant to change situations rather than equip you to endure whatever the world may throw at you. Faith is what was supposed to sustain Eve in the garden. Faith was what was supposed to keep her when the enemy did his best to try to destroy her. Faith is our keeper. 
I think we forget that we have an enemy aimed at destroying us. We have an enemy that'll dangle candy in front of your face like a baby, but is really aimed at utterly destroying you. We have an enemy that wants to kill you, devour you. And I'm not talking about a temporary type of death that only happens in this world, but I'm talking about the type of death that goes on forever. He wants to look over to his left and see you in the lake of fire right along with him rolling. That, that be your grave. When, when we really die and we're buried, that's not our grave. That's not our resting place, our ending place. Rather, it's a transitional moment in waiting for us to step into our life for eternity. But we have an enemy that wants to see us dead. And we've gotten so caught up with wanting to succeed in this world and material things. And I'm not coming from a disconnected place or perspective, but we've gotten so caught up in this world and materialistic things that we have forgotten what this is all about the saving of our souls. We've forgotten that all of this Jesus stuff, it's not just about running and jumping and just, oh my gosh, community, like that's good and that's great, but really it's about getting our souls saved. So we're becoming a part of Christian communities so that you can help me get my soul saved because when I'm by myself, I'm vulnerable to the enemy trying to take my soul away. So I'm not connecting with communities just for entertainment and fun, but I'm connecting to be built up in my faith that I can be sustained in every area that the enemy wants to take me out. I think we forget that we have an enemy that wants to take us out. So we leave ourselves vulnerable and susceptible to attack because we are forgetful human beings forgetful how quickly we forget who God is, how quickly we forget what God has done, how quickly we just forget when Paul said to forget, he did not say it, meaning forget what's necessary. He said forget, meaning forget what is unnecessary. Forget what it is that you don't need. And what you don't need is chaos, calamity, confusion, and confusion becoming your God. We're all worshiping idols. We're all worshiping false faces in our own way. I have a couple texts and I tried my best to put them into alignment because God actually gave me what I was going to talk about on Friday, maybe, or Wednesday. I think it was probably Wednesday. I don't know. I just didn't figure out how to say it. So I'm going to do the best that I can to be natural and I'm going to trust God to provide the super. We're going to Ecclesiastes 1. Initially, I wanted to read from the NIV, and I'm going to pull that one up, too, so that I can do a little bit of bouncing around, because there is some language in the NIV that is important and um, th that's important for us to um, for it all to make sense. So I'm going to go there. Everything is meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Not just some things, but absolutely everything is meaningless. Bear with me because I will contradict myself at one point and I'll point it out. But absolutely everything is meaningless. The words of the teacher. I kind of wanted to do New King James Version. And I said we're going to bounce because the New King James Version says preacher. When I first read the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of my favorite. Can you give a sec to grab a Bible? When I first read the book of Ecclesiastes. It was my favorite book, and it is still my favorite book, actually. I say Romans is my favorite book, but that's because I low-key forgot. Ecclesiastes is absolutely my favorite book. For my entire life, I have always wondered, what was the point? Somebody say, what's the point? What's the point? I have always wondered, what's the point? What sense does it make for me to spend my entire life working towards success and accomplishments, working towards building things up, working towards trying to attain anything in this world that I'm not going to be able to carry with me forever. 
What is the absolute point of me giving my all to something that I'll never actually be able to hold on to? I started to get frustrated with the fact that I, at my young age, am so mature. I'm not fooling around and doing these crazy things, though I did them, not doing them, just for me to focus and try to save a generation that's coming after me that may not happen. I said, we go ahead and we, 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 we try to give it the best that we got so our kids can have a better future. Ain't no kid possible if I don't have the kid. So maybe I wouldn't have to sacrifice my life if I just don't have a kid. That changes everything, right? I can learn to be happy with my level of living. I can learn to be happy with whatever it is I can do without trying to sell my soul away. We go to work nine to five every day, taking hours off of our life. Then we go to school. What does it profit a man? I I'm getting ahead of my nose. What does it profit a man, though, to do all of these things that are absolutely going to fade away? What purpose is there to build a family? Who cares about building a family if all of us are going to die at the end? Who cares? Do I really care about breaking a generational curse? I won't be here anyways. But why would God have cared to save us if we take on that perspective? I can't necessarily give you a solid answer because it's all meaningless. I can, though, give you some hope in the midst of what's meaningless. The words of the teacher, says the NIV, the words of the preacher says the New King James Version, because preaching is an understanding that all of this is meaningless. I'll leave that on the floor. Everything is meaningless. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Oh, Lord, let your word come forth by your Holy Spirit of truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. Meaning what do people gain from all of their work? I'm probably gonna just stick to the New King James Version and hope that it works out for me. Pray the grace of God be with me. It's not breath spray, it's for my throat. We're gonna do new king. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth stands forever. The sun also rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rose. It goes back to where it started. The wind goes toward the south and turns around to the north. The wind whirls around continually and comes again on its circuit. All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full. To the place from which the rivers come, there they return again. All things are full of labor. Man cannot express it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, hey Ashley, nor the ear filled with hearing that which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be done, and there is absolutely nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, see, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before. There is no remembrance of former things. There is no remembrance of former things, which means what purpose is there to work for something that may have already been worked? And even more, who's going to remember me when I'm gone anyways? Nor will there be any remembrance of things that are to come by those who will come after. Maybe the very people that I'm planting these seeds for won't even know who I am or what I did. I'm in the New King James. I, the preacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. This is Solomon, for those who don't know. And I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. All is meaningless, all is meaningless. I'm gonna go here back to the NIV because I want you guys to hear the word meaningless, not vanity.
I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless. A chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. Proverbs tells us to get wisdom. Wisdom brings you much. But now Solomon saying, and he also wrote Proverbs, that even wisdom brings you no profit. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a chasing after the wind. This too is pointless. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Chapter two, I said to myself, come now. I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is madness. And what does pleasure accomplish? I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly. My mind absolutely still guiding me with wisdom. I didn't let wisdom go just to embark on it, trying to attain tangible material things. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. He wanted to see what it was like to really live life by your heart's desire, taking no thought, taking nothing into consideration, but just living life to the fullest because he could. I made gardens and parks and planted. I, I undertook great projects. I built houses for myself and planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. If you think today's success is anything, you got to check out the success of the Old Testament. I acquired male and female singers and a Harlem as well, the delights of a man's heart. I became greater by far than anyone in Jerusalem before me. And all this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing. My eyes desired. I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my labor, and this was the reward for all my toil. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Then I turned my thoughts to consider wisdom and also madness and folly. I started to compare the two. What more can the king's successor do than what has already been done? I saw that wisdom was better than folly, just as light is better than darkness. The wise have eyes in their head. They don't just move without vision. They just don't move in confusion, but their eyes are in their head while the fool walks in the darkness. I'm in Ecclesiastes chapter two now, but I came to realize that the same fate overtakes them both. I came to realize that no matter the ounce of wisdom, nor how much of a fool I am, the same fate overtakes them all. Everyone has to face the same fate of death. All of us have to face the same fate of considered doom. We cannot change it. I know someone whose family owns a funeral home company or something like that. And then I said, okay, what do you want to do before I knew this? It's like, I'm going to go into funeral homes. So my family has a business. It's like, I always have a job. I'm like, that's true. Because all of us have to face that same fate. No matter how rich you are, no matter how poor you are, no matter how successful you are, all of us face the same fate of death. The only difference is who wakes up after it. The difference is not how we go down. Hey, Shania, it's how we get up. Then I said to myself, the fate of the fool will overtake me also. I don't get nothing by being wise. I got the same fate that the fool has. The fate of the fool will overtake me also. What then do I gain by being wise? I said to myself, this too is meaningless. For the wise, like the fool, will not be long remembered. The days have already come when both have been forgotten. Like the fool, the wise too must die. 
skipping down to verse 24 through 26. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? Everything is meaningless. Everything is purposeless. Yet Solomon says, despite all these things that are meaningless, there is one that gives life purpose. A person can do no, nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too, I see, is from the hand of God, for without him, who can eat and find enjoyment? How can we find purpose if we never find God to the person who pleases him? God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness, but to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. I think a lot of times we seek promise more than we seek process, not understanding that the process is what prepares you for the promise. I say that to say, a lot of the questions that you're asking will be answered if you just go with me. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Pointless even. Oh, pointless. How all things in this world are absolutely pointless. This is how Solomon opens up one of the most powerful and most necessary books of the Bible. From one perspective, people find depression in it. From another people, another perspective, people find hope in it. Me personally, I'm in the tail, of, I'm in the middle of both of them. It's not that I find depression, I just find what purpose is there. If you read your Bible cover to cover, you'll find that we are in the book of Ecclesiastes. There is no book in the Bible that sounds like Ecclesiastes whatsoever. Again, one of the most powerful and most necessary books of the Bible. It gives you a perspective about your entire existence that is rare in today's world. A world of quickness, a world of I'm into it, then I'm out of it. I liked you for a minute, but now I don't like you. It's a quick shifting and a quick shifting. Vanity, vanity, all is vanity. We have one Bible scholar, but Ecclesiastes highlights the fact that Everything is meaningless. It's one of the most powerful and most necessary books of the Bible, not by excitement or even by encouragement. He doesn't even do it from a deep theological perspective. Instead, Solomon simply opens the chapter by giving a warning. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless that maybe before you embark on another level of what you consider to be your journey, you might consider that it's meaningless. Maybe before you spend time away from your family and put it into a job or put it into a company, maybe you'll say this is meaningless, but maybe on your way back to the house, you'll have to argue, but maybe this too is also meaningless. Maybe it'll put you in a place of forsaking both of them and getting right with God. Maybe we put our family above our relationship with God. Maybe we put our wife above our relationship with God. And that's the problem. We're putting everything in this world, idols, before we put God. Mm, I would wake up early, but I've got to get my beauty sleep. I'm putting that before God. I would go to church, but I got to drive a little bit of way. I'm putting that before God. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, he says in a cry for help. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Solomon opens the book of Ecclesiastes by sending a clarion call. A clarion call not to success or to riches. Not a call to even work. He sends out a clarion call to simply worship. I think us as believers, as people of faith, the way Christians, I, I don't think we really understand what it means to worship, which is why I think it's so necessary that we highlight the fact that all of this is about what's to come. That's what worship is for. 
We worship God for the saving of our souls. We don't worship him to get material things in this world. Now, God desires that we prosper and be in good health as our soul does prosper. The Bible literally says in one of these Ecclesiastes, I can't bring it to mind, that money is absolutely necessary, that if it's a thing, money can solve it. I can't remember which Ecclesiastes. I was reading the whole book last night, but it's in here if you read it. But I didn't find that out last night. I knew that already. God already knows we need money for things, but that's not what it's absolutely about. It's not about the followers. It's not about exposure. I told you guys, God only elevates you to the level of your purpose. Meaning if you're going to have a million dollars in the bank, just to sit around and have a million dollars in the bank, God's not giving you that. God does not just place money in your bank account for fun, but he does say that I'll give you what everyone else is worshiping if you worship me instead. Because all things are meaningless, yet this is what we chase. We chase materials, things that fade away when this world ends. And I think we do forget, you may hear a little bit of repeating because I got ahead of my notes, that the world is absolutely ending. All of this is coming to doom and we forget that this life is only but for a moment, not an eternity. This life is a grace. Do you understand? This life is grace. That we can get back into alignment with God that we got out of alignment with and thereby make it back into eternity. We came here as eternal beings. Adam and Eve were brought here eternal, living forever. We disconnected from our eternity because as the Bible tells us, eternity has been placed within our heart. So because our heart was manipulated and we turned away from God, didn't I say at the beginning, faith was what was supposed to sustain us. Faith is locked in your heart posture. Everlast eternity is in your heart posture. Because our heart changed towards God, we disconnected from eternity. So God says, now I'm taking you out of eternity so that you won't be sinful forever. And I'm placing you into what I've called time, that this time will be a grace for you to get back into alignment with the God that you stepped out of alignment with. I'm giving you grace. We say, oh, we're running out of time. We're running out of time. But we always relate it to success, not our salvation. When God has given us time, to get our life together. Time was our grace. He placed Adam and Eve into time that they would be able to walk out this thing called sin, get the crookedness out of their heart, get the messed up dirtiness out of their heart and get back into God's good graces. But lo and behold, they had a child. It was Cain and Abel. And now we've got murderers. And from there, it just goes all the way down. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about what they did to Isaac, Jacob and his battle with Esau, all of this stuff going on. So God says, I'm going to send you someone who can redeem you from it all. I've sent Jesus Christ. So now you have access to get back into connection with me because me and sin cannot communicate. But the only way that you can get into that relationship, connection, and communication with me is by the one man, Jesus Christ. So we ain't live in a generation where people don't want to go through Jesus Christ because they think Jesus Christ is an average man like them and not better than them because all of us have come short and fallen into sin. In fact, we were born into sin, but there was one man who knew no sin, came no sin, but became sin for us. He came here for us, to redeem us, to restore us. Time is our grace. And we forget that this world is ending. We forget that we are only in something that's temporary and we take this temporary and we treat it like it's eternity. We take this temporary and we treat it like it's the best thing ever when this is only just preparation, process even. It's a, pr a pruning that we might get to glory. Might. It's possible that we might get to glory, but it requires that we stop caring about what is so meaningless. We're graced in time, yet we waste every day of that time trying to build ourselves up here when here was never meant to keep us forever. Here was a grace. God said, if you eat from this tree, you will surely die. 
He said, instead of killing you, I'm going to save you and kill what I hate. I'm going to kill part of it, but I'm going to save what I love. He killed an animal instead of killing them, clothed them with new garments, sent them on a new path to say, now you're going to have to work for food. You're going to have to work the land. Even birthing a child will be painful. It was once peaceful, now it's painful, because now the pain is what is going to provoke you to stick with me. Maybe it was a little bit too easy. Maybe I went a little bit too light on you. So I had to apply a little bit of pressure that you may understand what it's like to really not have me. Sometimes we get mad at our life because we feel like God is absent when we never actually appreciated his presence to begin with. We never actually valued his hand on our life. We never actually valued the partnership that we had with him. Oh, God, let us be lonely and experience loneliness, but we were never alone because he gave us him. But I'd rather go to strip clubs and I'd rather get on dating apps and I'd rather put myself out there as a fool just to find somebody who will validate me and appreciate me when Jesus already had. And so he removed everyone else away from me to give me an opportunity opportunity to come into connection with him, but I rejected that Cairo special, unique moment, hand-picked and hand-selected moment to know God in a way that no one else does. I rejected that moment for a person who could never even love me, value me, because it's all meaningless. We go out into this world as fools, and it's all meaningless. But then I'd be contradicting the word that says, even if we were to go out into this world being as wise as possible, even that is yet still meaningless. Maybe we're looking for meaning when we don't have to look for meaning. Maybe our challenge is simply reducing ourselves to knowing nothing but the Lord Jesus and him crucified. Maybe, just maybe, that's all that it's about. It's just understanding that, God, you're greater. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless, but, God, you're greater. And latching a hold of that greater. Meaningless, meaningless, everything is absolutely meaningless, but, God, but, God, you are greater. Yet we treat him like he's lesser. People asking about fasting and why we fast. People, I'm going on a fast. I want this job. I'm going on a fast. I want this house. I'm going on a fast for this and for that as if Jesus spent 40 years in the wilderness fasting for something he could hold in his hand. Jesus spent 40 years in the wilderness fasting for what he was building up in his heart posture. I'm back on my notes. The world is absolutely ending. All of this is temporary, and we're trying to turn temporary into eternity when temporary has just been a grace to get into eternity, access into eternity, that we might wake up after we're put to sleep. All of this is coming to doom, and we forget that this life is only but for a moment, not eternity. What would life look like to you if you lived every day as if this was only preparation for what's to come? I wish I could say that a little bit better. What would life be like if you woke up every day as if you had an opportunity to receive God's grace for better? I, I want to say that a little bit better. How would you be at peace mentally if you started just trusting in the intentionality of God. If you just started trusting in the fact that God has already ordained and aligned every single day that he allowed you to rise into to work for your good. The problem is we're not willing to let go of ourselves for God. We're not willing to relinquish our will to, to receive his will. We want to be our own gods. In fact, that's the world that we live in today. Everybody is their own God. Everybody's living by their own belief system, their own thoughts and imaginations and ideologies. Now, people don't want to believe the word because the word challenges you to step outside of your inadequacy and step into something that is adequate. People don't want to stand on any foundation. Everyone's swayed to the left and to the right by every form of doctrine. But don't be surprised because this is what the Bible says that there will be false doctrines and false prophets and false preachers. You got everybody on TikTok that wants to be some type of prophet and speak in the name of the Lord. You got witches and witchcraft running amok, even in our music. So now we have children being manipulated and we have no control over it. But this is what's to be expected. 
<laughs> you would think that in knowing all of this, it will provoke us as Christians to get into a deeper relationship with God. You would think we would spend more time in prayer and less time partying, but we have come, we have succumbed to being in the world and of the world, when we were to be in it and not of it, be transformed, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds, you would think that the chaos in this world would provoke us to be deeper in our word, but we are becoming debased. We sin. Sin isn't even just about what you do. Leave that alone. Sin is about who we have become as believers, as people, being the head of the world, but reducing ourselves to being the least garbage because we're going along with a broken system. God never wanted us to be the same person. He gave us personality, but he did say be of the same mind. And that comes from the word. Who in this dying generation is going to know their word? Oh, I'm, I, I, my heart breaks for the children that I see in church what type of world are they going to be living in? Yes, it's meaningless, but we're here living this meaningless, pointless life. Am I going to complain about it being meaningless or am I going to try to find to, or am I going to try to find some type of meaning and at least just stand in my purpose? But we're so focused on money and not purpose, profit and purpose. Not understanding that this world needs us. We rather sit and talk about what's wrong instead of being the solution that makes it, it right. We rather sit in our group chats gossiping instead of conversing, having conversations about how to build something better. The life available for us in eternity is the one we must receive. I'm off my notes for a moment. We'll come back. When I go to John chapter three, this is where we all fall short. Everybody knows John three sixteen. For God so loved the world, we only know it because we've heard it so many times, not that it's become a part of us. Maybe if it had become a part of us, we would not still question if God loved us. And if we stopped questioning if God loved us, we wouldn't be trying to receive the love of everyone else, which is really just lust. I'll leave that alone. John 3, I only want to focus on a certain place. Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Don't believe people who tell you we're automatically going to heaven because Jesus paid the price. He paid the price so that we would have freedom to make the decision. That decision being, I'm going to walk in newness. I'm going to walk in a new way. Initially, I wanted to title this message. Um, I initially wanted to title it, What Are You Seeing? We'll get there. <laughs> cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are reborn. You're not getting into heaven as you are right now. You're getting into heaven once you're reborn. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is the flesh, and that which is born of the flesh, uh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. I love verse eight. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. You cannot tell where it goes. You cannot tell where it comes from. Everyone wants to say, don't forget where you came from, but I've been reborn. I no longer belong there. And if you can still recognize me from my history, that means I have not got into alignment with my destiny. And how can two walk together lest they agree? This is Bible. So we pray asking God to lead us forward, yet we're worshiping idols that take us backward. Do you understand that reminiscing over the olden days is still worshiping an idol? It's over with. It's dead. Are we going to really relive the same day over and over? Or are we going to step out of stagnation into, what would you call that, production, into movement, because our God is not stuck? We sit, I, I, I don't like going to family events, all these uncles drinking alcohol, no shade. I, I had a DWI at one point, but drinking alcohol, talking about the olden days. Are you really that stuck in the 1900s? Has, is there nothing, no faith for you today? Do you not have hope for you tomorrow? You're just rehearsing the same things over and over. Now that has become our culture. So then we have trauma and toxicity pouring over into generations. Call it PTSD. Because we're so stuck in yesterday. Stuck in yesterday. Stuck in yesterday. 
We allow what we've experienced yesterday to break our hope for tomorrow and even cancel our faith in today. We're stuck and we're stagnant people, yet the world is always moving. The world is always moving, the world is always moving. I would say earn, going back to my notes for a moment, the life available. We forget that all of this is coming to an end. We forget that there is more after this. We forget that none of this is, that all of this is temporary, that we're fasting to get more in relationship with God of eternity, not of temporary. Our God is not tempor temporary. Our God is eternal. I would say earn. The life available for us in eternity is one we must receive. I would say it's a life we must earn, but that would mean we are owed everlasting life. You're owed something. When you've earned it, it's owed to you. We're not owed everlasting life. We are, though, gifted it. Yeah, what's a gift if you never receive it? I can have a package for you. I can have a present for you, and this can be your gift. But if I try to give it to you and you never received it, I've just wasted my money. I've wasted my time. I've wasted my life. Jesus wastes his life, arguably, for everyone who has the opportunity but doesn't actualize it. Meaningless, meaningless. I asked the Lord. I said, God, why did you die for us? I literally asked him. I said, why? For one, selfishly, I asked him because I'd be able to say that certain stuff is not fair. But I actually, hey, Brazil, I actually can't say anything's not fair because you died for us. So at first it was selfish. Like, God, I really could start complaining if you didn't die for us. But even more, why did you die for us? I can even make it about myself. Why did you die for me? Meaningless, meaningless. Dying for people that would never appreciate you or honor you. We're talking about idols. Why did you die for us? We focus so much on growth in the world as if whatever we gain can be sustained of and by ourselves when all of this requires God. If we go back to verse 26, Ecclesiastes 2, for God gives uh, da, 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 da. for God gives wisdom and knowledge. He gives work and gathering that his children enjoy the labor. Let's go to NIV because I have it right here. A person can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in their own toil. This too I see is from the hand of God. For without him, for without him, all of this requires God. We try to get success not understanding that even that requires God. I'll do the notes first. How do we get to the place of requiring God? Or maybe a better question is how do we get to the place of being in the right posture of requiring God? It's all about our posture. I said we focus on success and we get frustrated with God's delay as if God is slow or stagnant or idiotic. We get frustrated with God as if we were ever prepared for the promise in the first place. We get mad at the grace of God. God has given us grace. Okay, let me slow down. We get mad at the grace of God. The grace of God is process. The grace of God says, I'm not just going to put you in something that you won't handle. I'm not just going to put you in something aimed at destroying you, but I'm going to put you in something that I prepared you for by my grace, which is called process. Process is grace. I don't ever say it, but thank y'all for the gifts. Process is grace. So we get mad when God has us in his grace, which is process, wanting promise when the blessing will end up being a cursing if we are not prepared for for it. Okay? So then we step out of God's process thinking we're going to go further. This is Adam and Eve. They stepped out of God's process in the garden thinking they were going to go further by eating the fruit, not understanding that now you're only relying on your strength. Now you're only relying on your understanding. Now you're relying only on your resources. You thought that the gifts were going to work. Gifts do come without repentance, but gifts mean nothing without the anointing to back them up. So now you're trying to work your gift, but your gift's not working because you don't have the anointing that you had when you were in the grace of God. So then we leave God's process and we try to sustain ourselves and we have our own built up faith that we have of ourselves and in ourselves. I had a Lyft driver the other day try to talk to me about the Bible and the Bible says that if the word of God is veiled, it'd be that they're already perishing. So I just sat silently and minded my business and let him perish as he perished. But we have our own faith which is only in ourselves.
So then when things don't work out and when things don't go the way that we hoped they would go for who hopes for what they have, we hope for what's to come because things didn't go when I finally got to it. It didn't go how I was hoping for it to go. Now I'm mad at God as if I didn't already disown and reject God and say, I'm going to see for myself. I'm going to go and do it by myself. So when God doesn't back me up and me deciding to do it by myself, how can I be mad at God when I started worshiping idols? I started worshiping promise and not the God of the promise. So now I'm in the land that's supposed to be the promised land, but it's looking like hell because I disconnected from the God that causes everything to work for good. What the enemy means for evil will still work for good. I prepare a table for you in the presence of my enemies. Now I think it's a hijacking because I disconnected from the God that was controlling it all. Back to my nose. How do you get to the place of requiring God? Everything is about posture. I say get to the place of requiring God, but then that makes us think that we have to arrive at a certain level of understanding. That makes us believe that we have to arrive at a certain level of salvation or righteousness, as if we could ever be righteous of our own self. I'm not in the hospital. As if we could ever be righteous of our own self. So there's not a place, there's a posture. I want to go to Acts chapter 9 quickly. Acts 9, we're going to do verse 10 through verse 19. Actually, we'll come back later. I'm going to do number one. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus. This is Saul, who ended up becoming Paul, who wrote uh, Romans. And asked letters from him to Damascus, so that he found any who were of the way. If he found any who were of the way, meaning Christians, whenever I say people of the way, I'm referring to this moment right here. Whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. As he journeyed, he came to Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Robin, why are you in Acts chapter 9? I want you to understand. Saul, before he became Paul, was a persecutor of Christians. He was killing them. How we are the branches and he are the vine. Exactly. He was killing them. He was completely going against everything that he began to build himself. God did not wait until Saul became Paul. God intervened on Saul's journey to still stay Saul and made him Paul in the midst of his inadequacy. Let me walk you through the text. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly, suddenly, without expectation, Paul didn't have to turn around. I mean, Saul didn't have to turn around three times. He didn't even give his life to Jesus. God does not wait for you to give your life to him to come and take your life from you. As he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Someone say suddenly. So, someone already said, shout out spirit filled. Suddenly. I like that. We're in sync. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gold. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight and neither ate or drank. Suddenly, Paul went from being a killer of Christians to a redeemer of Christians because he was in the right posture. What was the right posture? It wasn't that Paul hated Jesus. Paul was only operating in what he understood. So God said, I'm going to take you thinking what you understand is right. I'm going to take what you think you understand and thinking that is right. And I'm going to turn it for my glory. The, the path that you were once on doing the wrong thing, I'm going to put you on a new path doing kind of the similar thing, but it'll be the right thing. When Saul went and became Paul, he, he was still doing the same thing, going to different cities, going to gather people, seeking people that he might find and bring them into what he was believing. And at first he was believing in, you know, the cancellation of Christians. And now he was believing in the building of Christians. What is your point? My point is being in the right posture for God to intervene into your life. A lot of times we focus on getting into the right place when it's all about the right posture moving to let go of the life we so desire. God, help me to say it the right way, Lord. A life that leads us nowhere and a life that only produces death. You have to understand when God comes and encounters you.
When you have an encounter with God, you have to understand it. You have to be bold about it. You have to know it and not question it. The reason Saul was able to become Paul so quickly was because he believed in his encounter. Immediately, he said, I am no longer going to continue being this old version of myself. I am going to step into the new having an intervention with God. Oh, Lord, help me to say it. Help me help, help me to say it. Help me to say it. I think we must ask ourselves a true question. Do I really want God more than I want the world? Let's, let's, let's go here. Or am I willing to lose God to gain the world? But I heard the Bible say in Mark 8, 36 through 37, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? We forget quickly that we have an enemy aimed at stealing our soul. I know I said this. Let's move. To give a little scripture behind it, I'll repeat it a little bit. An enemy that is not on our side, does not care about us, and is not our friend. First Peter 5 and 8 would say, be sober, sober, be vigilant, vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Satan is not looking to just mess up your money or your family, though that too. That's where we try to minimize things. He's seeking to take your faith away. He's seeking to take your faith away from God and place it into him that he may devour and utterly destroy you because faith is the only thing that can save you. To devour means to destroy completely, meaning Satan doesn't just care about destroying you here because here is only temporary, but he's aimed at destroying you for eternity, then when the day comes, he's rolling in the lake of fire, you will be there with him also, right? We have a real enemy. And we have become so debased that the enemy has become the enemy now. We have become so debased that the enemy has now become the enemy because it's no longer Satan trying to convince us to go along with him. But it's that we're already going al along with him. So now we have to come into warfare against ourselves. Our greatest challenge is overcoming ourselves. Letting go of hell to receive heaven. The question then becomes, how do we effectively do this? How do we effectively do this? Not for accomplishments, not for success, but for the saving of our souls. It's simple. We do it by faith. This faith not being in ourselves, the challenge of change, and our own resources, nor in the things of this world, but our faith being in God. I'm not talking about armor right now, though yes, but armor is an indication that the battle that we're fighting means anything. It's meaningless. No. Faith brings everything meaning. Faith is what gives us an opportunity to walk into our next. Our next is not being us making more money. Our next is not us having a nice car, a nice house. Our next being going from temporary to eternity. It's about faith. We have the shield of faith, but that's preparing us for battle. I want to prepare you guys for life because this is not living. This is dying. The Bible says we die every day. Though our outward man is perishing, our inward man is being renewed day by day. We're dying on the outside, but every day we're being built up on the inside. But our faith being in God, true worship for the Savior of our soul, not a million dollars in the bank or a social following, not to have an American Express business platinum card or a, or a centurion card. Everybody loves looking at stuff. I'm leaving it alone. Solomon tells us everything is meaningless to stop us from giving our faith away. Didn't I tell you guys before we're in a faith fight? Anytime you look at what you don't have and start worrying and being anxious, you give your faith away to Satan. You are saying that God is not able to care for you more than the world can. And that's when the enemy begins to pull you away from your faith in God and to having faith in yourself. Then when we finally step into faith in ourselves, we get mad. It doesn't work out when faith in ourselves was never to produce anything. Going now to Acts 9, to my verses, I wanted, I talked about wanting to make this, what are you seeing? What you set your eyes on, the Bible says that the eyes are a gateway to the soul. What you set your eyes on ultimately is what you become on the inside. This is Sunday service, not Bible study. 
It's what happens on the inside. What you see determines what you become on the inside. I said before, that's why for people who want to um, expand e expansion, people who want to get into a million dollar house, I'll say go to a house or opening. Set your minds on it. The reason I have this $2.9 million townhouse in Atlanta, $3.7 million house in Atlanta, $3.9 million condo in Atlanta. I've got I, I got to figure out which one I want. I say, God, I'm going to give it to you clearly. I have my book that's coming out titled Power Over the Mind. It's all about the mind and the way that you think. I put the cover of it on there. I'll show y'all soon. I put purpose and profit. I put every business name that God has given me, ministry and marketplace and a bunch of other stuff, not to worship the success, but that I can see it, that my mind will be focused on going higher. We're in Acts chapter nine. We're not there yet that I can see that, that I'm not seeing death. I'm not seeing hate. I'm not seeing, I used to not even look at the comments, so I didn't see failure, but that my eyes would only be set on success. I have a solid understanding that it's not about the money, but about the purpose. But I know for a fact that my purpose is going to bring me money. So I'm not worshiping the money. I'm just in expectation for the profit that's coming because I've tapped into my purpose. And I set my eyes on those things so that when what I'm experiencing begins to contradict who I am on the inside, I don't fall susceptible to the attack of the enemy to try to convince me that I'm something that I'm not. I stand moving forward. The just shall live by faith and not by sight. I'm not living what I, by what I see, but what I'm seeing is only a reflection of what I'm believing already. Okay? Acts chapter 9. I wanted to talk about what you were seeing, and I heard God, I heard God say Acts chapter 9 because Saul, and I'm going to break it down, then we're going to read it. Saul was blinded by a bright light. He opened his eyes and couldn't see anything once he opened them, but then he was blinded for real. He had to be led back from that spot to this house that was in um, Damascus. He made it to the place that he was intending to go, but there was a different purpose for him in that place. You have to be available for God having a different purpose for you, yet still being in the same place. Yes, you got to the place, but the purpose behind being in the place was a little bit different. Hear me differently. Hear me clearly. No contradiction, just a continuation. Now there was a certain disciple, verse 10, Acts 9, at Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas, not the one who betrayed Jesus. It's a different Judas. Why was everybody naming them, them childs Judas? I don't know. Arise and go to the street called straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he is praying. What did I tell y'all? Saul was blinded. Saul had an intervention on his trip, yet he was still in the right posture. Y'all not hearing me clearly. Say I'm in the right posture. I'm in the right posture. I'm in the right posture. Shout out to my mods. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Spare no mute. Spare no block. I'm in the right posture. Saul was praying. Paul did not start, Saul did not start worshiping idols. He didn't start worshiping blindness. He didn't start worshiping confusion. He didn't start worshiping wondering where I am. He didn't do any of that. People just grabbed him and started leading him where he needed to go. He said, okay, God, because I've had this encounter with you, I understand that everything after this moment, you're in it. Before it, he didn't think Jesus was with him. He didn't think so. That's often how we are before we get saved. We don't think Jesus is with us, but Jesus don't just show up randomly. He said, before I formed you, I knew you. Jesus already knew what he was going to do with Paul, Saul, Paul. Paul didn't start worshiping idols when things went chaotic. That would be the devil aimed at stealing his faith and shifting his worship from and what's wrong to the God of everything that's right. Paul said, in these type of moments, I know exactly what to do. I don't lean further away, but I've pressed further into God. God doesn't respond to the level of my placement. He responds to the level of my posture. Paul said, despite me being blind, saw Paul, same person, bear with me, saw, said, despite me being blind, not knowing where I am, shout out to Liberia, I'm going to pray. I'm not calling nobody. I'm not having a therapy session with people that's in the household. We're not about to have a gossip session. Oh my gosh, I don't need your sympathy and I don't need your empathy. He said, I'm just going to pray about it. 
as he was praying. And in a vision, he sees a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hands on him so that he might receive his sight. God will give you the answer, but it's going to be through prayer. 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man. He was scared. Sometimes God will do you, ask you to do some things that don't make sense. I've heard about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. Why is Ananias trying to tell God what God already knows as if God don't already know what God already knows? And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name, to kill everyone who's a Christian, who's a believer, who says the name of Jesus. That's why I said that why God is good and thank you, God. We wake up just, this is easy for us. Being a Christian is just easy for us. Yeah, we got stuff in the world, but truth be told, being a Christian is easy. They were actually being killed for being Christians. They actually had enemies for being Christians. They had actually had people coming after them for being Christians. So when they would wake up and say, God, thank you for another day, it was really a blessing because they could have absolutely died, but God kept them. <sighs> Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, said God. God didn't respond to everything that Ananias said, but the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel, for I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. We're not suffering randomly. It's for God's sake. Everything is meaningless, but I told you what gives life meaning? God gives life meaning. So it's all for God's sake. 17, and Ananias went his way and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, Road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. If we go back to Ecclesiastes chapter two, he said only sinners have to go and gather. God will send what you need if you're in relationship and alignment with him. God sent me to you. Everything that you were looking for, wishing for, waiting for, and hoping for, what you saw in a vision, God sent it your way. You didn't have to look for it. All you had to do was pray and give it to God and God sent it your way. I don't know an idol that will send something your way that will save you. I just know an idol that will give you something that's going to kill you. Mm, suffer from an Ananias went his way, laying his hands on him. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. When God comes to change your life, it's going to be immediate. It's all about the decisions that follow the immediately. Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales and he received his sight at once and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened and Saul spent some days with the disciples in Damascus, blinded at first, given vision immediately. But then it's important to note what happens after he's given his vision immediately. Paul doesn't lose faith because he couldn't see. He stood on his encounter and believed God. Paul was able to keep moving forward because he stood on the encounter that he had with Jesus. Okay. And one day, unexpected, God sends someone to deliver him. Paul had the faith for it. Saul had the faith for it, whatever. He saw it. He had the faith for it. He was believing it. Didn't know when it was ha going to happen. Didn't know how it was going to happen. He just knew what he saw. He believed enough in what he saw that it positioned him to stand in his faith because faith is not for tomorrow. Faith is for today. My hope is for tomorrow. God sends someone to deliver him because despite what happened, he had the right posture. When you're in the right posture with God, you don't have to work for things. Things work for you. But notice the text Immediately when God set Paul on a new path, he went into it fully, not rejecting it or turning back, but going full speed ahead. Saul did not delay in going full speed ahead. Hear me clearly. Everything in this life is meaningless. Chasing success is meaningless. Chasing after riches, chasing after material things, chasing after marriage and relationships, it's all meaningless. That's not to say stay in the house all day. That would be absolutely stupid. Though we all are going to have the same punishment, baby, life can absolutely still be a little bit better while we're here. That doesn't mean to close off from everyone. It does mean to recognize what is meaningful and what is purposeful, right? So when we step out of worshiping idols... When we stop worshiping material things and we stop worshiping our envision and how we envision ourselves, when we stop worshiping what we want to accomplish and we start worshiping our God who will give us every accomplishment necessary and desired, from that point, now that we are in, in the awareness, having been come to the place of revelation to know that we've been worshiping false idols, right? Now we have an option, an opportunity, and a responsibility to pivot. 
Okay, I'm gonna make sure all the texts are making sense because they absolutely are going together. I hope I've said them in a way that that, it, that I've communicated what it is he gave me as effectively as possible, but everything that I'm saying is going together. It's not contradicting. Paul was saw, he was a Christian killer, he was blind. God intervened in his darkness and shone a light. That light seemed like it was blind because when God comes and pulls you out of your history to prepare you for your destiny, it's going to look like you're blind. Everything is going to be confusing. Everything is going to be uncertain, but that's because he's aimed at giving you real vision. I pray that the eyes of your understanding be open. And Paul didn't get his understanding with his eyes. He got his understanding within his heart. Okay. God sent Ananias to lay hands on Saul. At that moment, Saul became Paul because he went from being blind to seeing clearly. He was able <coughs> to step out of that moment seeing clearly and he never went backward. How do you know, Robin? I wanted to make sure I recap that because the text moves quickly because when God has you in a moment, you've got to move quickly. Verse 20. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples at Damascus. That's verse 19. We just concluded that. Immediately. Somebody say immediately. Immediately. He preached the Christ in the synagogues. Paul came to Damascus. He was in the same place. He went there to kill Christians. Yet immediately. Once God intervened in his life. Once he caught on to the fact that there was more. He didn't go back. Immediately, he started preaching the Christ in the synagogues. That he also, that he is the, the, the son of God. Then all who heard were amazed and said, is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem and has come here for that purpose so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. We're in Acts chapter 9, verse 20 through 22. Immediately, Saul became Paul and he went full speed ahead in Paul, not going backwards. What happens is we give our life to Christ and we still have our toe in the world. We give our life to Christ and we're still looking back. We're like, oh my gosh, look at how much fun they're having. Yeah, they're going to have so much fun in hell, burning in the fire. Do you really want to go play with people that are going to burn in a fire? No. Oh, they're having so much fun. Oh my gosh, I wish I could be doing that. Everyone thinks being a Christian is boring. No, y'all make being a Christian boring. Being a Christian is one of the most exciting things in the world. I've got real joy. Y'all got it for fake. In my book, I'm going to be talking about fake peace and how we all have this watered down version of peace because only God can give real peace. Robin, what is the entire point? The point is that there is more. And that more is not in the world, that more is in Jesus. And the more that you get in Jesus, the more that the world makes sense. Uh, what's his name? Solomon goes on to say, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases much sorrow. When you really come to a place of wisdom, when you really come to a place of understanding, you begin to see the world differently. And it's just like, oh my gosh. That's when you stop arguing with people. That's, not when, that's when you stop going back and forth with people. That's when you stop feeling down just because people didn't accept you or agree with you. Like, baby, you really couldn't do any better. That's when you stop living under the bondage of childhood trauma and PTSD and what he did and she did to you. It's because you understood that the world is just crazy and just messed up. And you'll be just like them if you don't step out of trying to go along with the world and go against the world. To be disruptive. And we say disruptive. They say if you want to be a billionaire, you have to create something that's, that's disruptive. And we make disruption all about getting something in our hand. Not understanding disruption is about getting something in your heart. That all of this life is meaningless. So am I going to spend my entire life walking out something that makes no sense and that has no effect? Or am I going to be bold enough to give my life to God to receive something worth having? Are you willing to fight for the kingdom? Becomes the question. Because all of this is about kingdom. Matthew 11 and 12 says the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. The kingdom of heaven is under attack. Not that it will ever win. That's not it. It's under attack here. The kingdom is under attack here. Heaven can't be touched. God wants to know who's going to fight for me. <laughs> I am answering questions if it's in alignment with what I'm talking about. Who will take the kingdom back by force? 
I'm hoping for more. I'm, I'm hoping for better, right? That's good. But I'm having faith for right now. And if I'm going to have faith for my right now, I can't have faith for my right now and place it on a shelf. Faith for my right now means, God, I'm locked in with you. And if I'm going to be a disciple, a disciple is not sitting at the highest point in the hill. I don't like one of these condos because it's all the way up in the sky. And though I would like the view because I like to see far, I want to be on the ground. Because being a disciple is not being up and away from everybody. It's being in the people. It's being absolutely in the people. It is what we do for the Lord that brings us profit and value. It's serving. It is only those things that produce meaning in life and will carry us on to eternity. I want to know, are you willing to abandon your worship towards worldly idols and restore your worship to Christ our King? Crystals, there's no problem with crystals unless you're making them the source of your power. And so today, my entire goal, and I don't know if I've succeeded, was to talk about a new man that we must put on. John 3 talks about us having to be reborn of the spirit. Not living in what we used to live in before, not even trying to become a new me in the world. Oh, I want to be a new me. So we take all these self-development classes. We do shadow workbooks and we buy anything and everything from what's here on um, uh, TikTok. And, and we go and we take all these co coaches and we go to all these people who don't even know their Bible. No, to put on a new man is to give your life to Christ. Is manifesting witchcraft? No, manifesting is not witchcraft unless you make manifesting your God. Witchcraft is when you give, when you pull power from anything that is not the Lord Jesus. Manifesting in Christ is when you go to God in prayer. You wake up every day and you make the right decisions. Baby, you don't have to go in circles. You don't have to make no chance. Manifesting in Christ is getting into alignment with the will of God where everything is already set up for your success. So then I don't have to worry about working it out. I'm just getting into alignment with what's already worked out. Demonic manifesting is when you're doing all these rituals because you don't want to get into alignment with God. So there's that. For God gives wisdom and knowledge and joy to man who is good in his sight, but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting, that he may give to him who is good before God. This is also vanity and grasping for the wind. Sinners manifest. People of God get into alignment. I don't have to worry about making things happen, babe. This is what the text is saying. If you stop worshiping idols, you will not have to worry about making anything happen. All you have to worry about is staying in alignment with the God that makes all things happen. This is what Ecclesiastes is talking about. In all of this, being wise matters not. Being fools matters not. All of us are going to face the same fate. What matters is the relationship that you have with Jesus. Don't go around just saying, God, you got to call him by name. Everybody has a God. Everybody has a God. Satan is the God of this world, if we want to be biblically correct. I'm talking about Jesus believing unto the saving of your soul. That's what I'm talking about. That all of this thing that we are in called life, it's not about anything that we're chasing after. And I find that we are subconsciously worshiping idols. It's not that we wake up every day like, oh, I'm going to worship an idol, but we are worshiping these idols. And at the end of all of these idols is nothing but death and hell, condemnation. I thought there was no condemnation. Yeah, but that's only in Christ. In Christ, there is no condemnation. Outside of it, I don't know what to tell you about that. But then I also want to give you this because I, I'm here. I kept on reading, obviously. To everything, there is a season. This is chapter three. We make ourselves idols too. We absolutely do. But sometimes I feel like we don't honor ourselves enough to the point that we do worship idols. If you really loved yourself like you so claim, you wouldn't worship other idols. You would worship the God that builds you up. It's like God is not selfish at all. Literally. Literally. When we go before God and worship, we're strengthened. When we give him praise, blessings flow. What can I give God that he won't give me anything back for? God is not selfish. 
If I loved me, I would love God. And God desires that we love ourselves because he said, literally, love each other as you love yourself. Why would, does that make sense? Everybody says, so, this is a real thing in the old church. They really think that self-love is demonic. Some churches really do think that. And I say, well, do you read your Bible? This is basic biblical understanding. First commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. He, she, and it doesn't exist. I mean, you're right from one perspective and wrong from another. God absolutely made us male and female. But if we go into the spirit, there's no genders in the spirit, but babe, we're in bodies. So the, yes, I do go to DBU. So there's that part. But I want to go here. God predetermines the events of life. I'm going to read it in the New King James Version. Let me, let me see. A time for everything. I'm going to do the New King James Version. Oh, I, I'm going to close my point, though, because you said you went to church and felt judged. That's because what I come to find out is people who have found no meaning will always continue to be evil people. There are some, I love my church. I believe I go to one, one of the greatest, the greatest church on the planet. I only say one of because they, when I start my church, right? But one of the greatest, the greatest church on the planet. But there are so many evil, bitter people in my church. And that's not to say the church is horrible. No, every church has problems. I can only talk about my community because I'm in my community. There are so many evil, bitter people and they're just mad because they have not found meaning. You come here every day to watch the man of God at the top and you feel like, and you live your life at the bottom. We were not as Christians supposed to just be serving someone at the top. That top is supposed to be Jesus. You, every time I go and watch my pastor, Bishop T.D. Jakes, I see what's possible for me. Every time I watch Sarah Jakes Roberts preach, preach while wow, I love her so much for real, is a little bit selfish. It's because I see myself. Because if y'all can do it, I know I can too. <laughs> as Christians, exposure is everything. And that's why the Bible says Jesus is the firstborn of many brethren and, and many wondrous things you'll do or, or whatever. Ooh, T.D. Jakes, you're not a Christian if you're going to judge another Christian. These and greater works you'll do because exposure is everything. I want you to start believing for the more, right? And so there are so many people who are evil and hateful. And because they never learn to love themselves, they never really learn to receive, to learn how to love everybody else. I don't know if I want to make this that type of conversation, but because they were silenced as a child, now they want to go on and silence children. That's how generational curses and generational trauma continues because I was done bad. Now I want to do you bad instead of being the one that's going to make it better. God predetermines the events for life. So yeah, and I'm done with this and I'll move on. Number one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your strength, all your soul, everything. And two, love your each other, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God, right? Love each other, love yourself. How I love, first is how I receive the love of God determines how I love him back because he loved us first. I love him with the same love given unto me. Then because I learned how to receive his love, gave that love back to him. He showed me how to love myself. <coughs> He showed me how to love myself. Then we're leaving. That's my throat. He showed me how to love myself. Now I'm able to love everybody else. I cannot go around loving other people until I get to the place of loving myself. Yeah, I was at TPH. I cannot get to the place of loving myself. Mm -hmm. Look familiar? Yes, I was at TPH. And so that was my one point that I wanted to close. Number two. I might not be able to remember if we're going to move forward into chapter three. Lord, if it's necessary, bring it back to my remembrance. To everything, there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. Oh, I remember. Thank you, Lord. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Okay. The reason this generation has turned away from the church is because the church has become a place of evil and vindictiveness and malice and hate. Not my church. I'm just talking about y'all church. Um, every church has issues, but this is what the church capital C collective has become. So now this generation does not want to go to church because church has become religion based and not relationship based. I love my church, the Potter's House, because it's relationship based. We literally was up at the altar, baby. I crawled my way to the altar and I'm not going to talk about that because that's my business. And I lay out at the altar. We have people there all the time. I, I need relationship, not religion. Right. And so it is so important that as this new generation, that we become 
intentional about not continuing the same broken processes, right? Because we have souls at stake. The Bible goes on to say that the blood of those souls will be on our hands as leaders assigned to redeeming these people, assigned to saving these souls. You have become a part of them, right? And so now the blood is on your hands to them. And so, yes, this replay will be posted on my YouTube channel. And so now the blood is on our hands. We've got to be better. And it comes by understanding that the only place of meaning in life is not in tithes and offering. It's not money. Though, if you want to support my ministry, you can click the link in my bio and click the dollar sign. But it's not about tithes and offerings. It's not about money. And that's why people don't trust the church or like the church, because they made it about money. They made people feel uncomfortable. They make people feel like, oh, you can't walk like this. You can't talk like this. When the Bible literally says none of that matters. He said, the wise person doesn't matter. The fool doesn't matter. The hater doesn't matter. None of this matters at all. It's not about money. What matters is God. So we live in a generation of people who are thirsting after God. So they're smoking their life away. They're drinking their life away. They're sexing their life away. We over here going crazy over Beyonce, and I do like her too, but I'm not gung-ho crazy no more. We have people who have are fan addicts over people and made people their God because we're all seeking for some type of, we're all looking for some type of fulfillment, some type of validation, some type of increase, and we're not going to get it externally. It's only going to come internally by the Lord Jesus. Nothing in this world will satisfy us. I used to love clothes like crazy and shoes. Now I don't really care because it don't bring nothing. I'd be mad that I spent all this money on clothes. Really? It was one time. I, I don't even want to talk about the time. I don't because I'd be like, it's meaningless. It's absolutely meaningless. None of this absolutely matters. And we've got to get that ingrained in our head. That way, when we encounter people, we'll stop just having quick, I'm in and I'm out. We'll stop just, just ignoring them and we'll stop just putting them down and we'll stop treating people badly. We'll start loving people because life is meaningless. I've got to love you while I still can because you can be dead. Can I tell you a story? My, 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 my God, not God, my, 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 my mom's sister, call her an aunt, right? One of them fake aunts that we do in black uh, culture. It was a fake aunt. That's my aunt, but she ain't my aunt. She's just my mom's best friend. She got had her anniversary on a Friday. It was an event center and all this stuff. I went to help set up, and then I ended up hosting the event. I didn't even go expecting to host. I only went to set up. But after a while, I asked my, I'm like, who's hosting? And she's like, I guess we are. I'm like, okay, now I'm thrown in the fire of hosting, but I'll do what I can. I do what I came to do. And so the main thing is love. And so I um I had to change because I had on setup clothes. I said, baby, if I'm hosting, I got to put something on to be a hosting outfit, okay? And so I asked someone, I asked my cousin or something like that, cousin essentially through the auntie that's not my auntie. And so um I uh, went, oh, I asked him to take me to get my clothes and to change. He did. It was great. We, we, we knew each other like growing up or whatever, but I didn't know them for real, right? Ignore the comments. Stay focused, y'all. Um, I, I didn't know him for real like that. We didn't really talk that much for real, but I asked him. And so he said, yeah. And we went and it was good and it was great. And we had a quick little combo and it was all of that. But I understand God intentionally connects me with people. Had closed out the night, all that stuff, right? I was exposed to be in ministry. The, the Bible says a prophet is only without honor in their own home. So I'm not seen the same all the time when I go home. Now, because they weren't real family, but family... They saw me in ministry and that got exposed, but no one really knew that because I don't go around, oh, I'm in I'm ministry or whatever. You're not going to get that vibe from me because that's not how Jesus went around, right? And so when they caught on to that, it was different. And so the next day, I'm asleep. I'm minding my business, having a good slumber. My phone's ringing and I woke up and I answered my mom over here. Can you pray? We need you to start praying. We need you to start praying. Day Day, which is the person who ended up taking me to get my stuff, is in the hospital. He had a heart attack. He apparently died. They had to revive him. I'm not just telling y'all this story for entertainment. I'm trying to highlight that everything is meaningless, but to love each other. The day before he was at that party, we were laughing and talking. He took me to get my clothes. I ain't talked to the man in years since I was a child. The next day, they're calling me to pray for him because he died and they had to revive him. I'm waking up putting on clothes, rushing to the hospital. I was in Michigan. I don't live in Michigan, so I was staying at my grandmother's house. I had to get her out the bed. 
Um, they were like, can you pray? I don't like people just calling me, putting me on the spot to pray like that. Baby, what you need to pray for? Why am I praying and stuff like that, right? And so I was like, I'll come up to the hospital. I need to put my eyes on the situation. God didn't say just pray. I need to put my eyes on the situation. I said, can you take me? Took me immediately. I'm at the hospital. We over here praying. And from that moment, I started to understand life is meaningless. The conversation that we had in the car was meaningless. It all faded away in an instant. The laughs that we had yesterday turned to tears today. Read the whole book of Ecclesiastes. It turned to tears today. I think I even read it where he said even laughter is pointless. But what mattered was that I had an opportunity to connect with him. One small moment did that. You only can reap where you sow. So he reaped a blessing because I connected with him. He ultimately did pass away. And I understood. I thought it was going to be, God, let me pray for him. He's going to be better. No, I understood. I just had to prepare him for his transition. It's a heavy weight standing in that position. I'm not going to talk about that. We'll talk about that another day. I'm instead highlighting the importance of loving each other. I'm instead highlighting the importance of being there for each other because life is meaningless. And if I step on you trying to get what I want for myself, I'll get it and it'll be like, what's the point? I don't know what I was doing. I don't know. I was sitting in my spot talking to God. I sat there and I was like, Lord, what, what would be the point? There was a time when I was focused on material things. Now, your taste is a, a is an indication of your destiny, right? Uh, that's why I tell people all the time, don't try to latch a hold of my faith and say, you going to put a $3 million condo on your wall. Okay, but are you going to work? Has God placed the burden of responsibility that comes with that on your life? Don't latch a hold of other people's faith, but your taste bud is an indication of where God has you to go. And I used to be very materialistic before I understood that the material I desire is only an indication of the purpose he's placed down on the inside of me, right? But I literally was sitting on this hill and I was like, God, what would be the difference right now between me being in this condo, looking out into the world and me sitting on this hill right now, preparing for Sunday, staying in worship, just having a conversation with you? What would be the difference? Absolutely nothing. So why would I set my focus on an expectation? I'm not saying abandon your expectation. No, because then when tomorrow comes, you'll forsake tomorrow for your today. You got to be like David living in the both. David was able to handle what was at home, but be prepared for what was in his destiny. Because happiness starts right now. Happiness doesn't happen in 10 years or 10 days. Happiness happens right now. Understand this. Anyways, moving to the text. I had this conversation. What would matter? Y'all know about the blue Tesla that I have, uh, that I want from, for my birthday, by my birthday. I'm like, God, what does it matter? And I felt myself getting sucked back up into it. And I'm like, okay, I ain't going to abandon it yet unless you tell me to. We were really having a conversation about this. And he was like, no, you're good. But I'm like, what does it really matter? But I want you to be encouraged today. Ecclesiastes chapter three says, to everything there is a season. A time for every purpose under heaven. A time to be bored and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace, embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to gain and absolutely a time to lose. Don't get sick. Whether I'm healthy or whether I'm sick is absolutely meaningless. My Bible says that if the body be sick, the spirit will keep it well. But who will help a broken spirit? This is Bible. I don't care too much about getting sick in my body because I'm strong enough spiritually to be kept. What you don't know is I'm actually better than I would have been had I not tapped into the spiritual realm. That's a lesson for another day. So I ain't worried about no sickness. I've got the Holy Ghost. That don't mean don't wear your mask and wash your hands. It just means that if you do fall susceptible to sickness, you'll be all right if your spirit's well. But if your spirit's broken, can't nothing else save you. You can be well in your flesh all day, but if your spirit is broken, can't nothing else save you. I'm well in my spirit. If you're well in your spirit, say, I'm well in my spirit. I'm well in my spirit. <laughs> 
I may have some things going on in my body. I got to go to a chiropractor. You know what I'm saying? I may need to get some arch support, but I'm well in my spirit. That I am. <laughs> I am well in my spirit, baby. You can hate me. You can talk bad about me. You can look down on me. That's all fine, but I'm well in my spirit. I'm sorry, just a bit of therapy if I can. I'm well in my spirit. I didn't go, I didn't, I don't know. I, 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 I'm just well in my spirit. I'm sorry. Every time the devil comes and tries to talk to me about my problems, I start talking to him about my promise. I'm well in my spirit. I'm sorry. Yeah, my mind sometimes switches to the left and to the right, but I don't live by my mind. I live by my spirit. So I cast down every Every thought that goes against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the sick say I'm healthy. I'm well in my spirit. So when depression comes and tries to knock me down, when chaos, calamity, and confusion tries to suffocate me, I respond not with my own thoughts and ideologies, but because I'm well in my spirit, my spirit, I respond with the word. The word of God. This says my present sufferings of today aren't to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed. And I let the devil know that the glory that I'm in expectation for is not just tangible, but I'm in expectation to dance in the place that you were rejected from. I'm in expectation to live in the place that you were kicked out of. I'm in expectation to be last laughing while you're burning. You may be laughing while I'm suffering here, but you're suffering for eternity. I'm gonna get the last laugh. I'm well in my spirit. Every time I try to, every time the world tries to take us low, you as Christians have to be well in your spirit to be high. That's our drug. That's our fix. It's the Holy Ghost. It's the word of God. Do you understand that the word of God will fortify your mind that no matter what comes up against it, you shall not be shaken? I heard the Bible say that if you build your house on the rock, you won't be moved. The word of God. If I could tap into that, and even though we're leaving, you have to get into the word of God. The, the Quran, I don't not believe in the word, the Quran. It talks about Jesus, but maybe I live by Bible. I'm not here to talk about the Quran. I just live by the Bible. I just know the Bible to be true. So there are times for everything. A time to weep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to silence and a time to speak. There are some seasons where you're to be silent. Because your words are going to push you further away from God and not lead you closer. But then there are other seasons where you are to speak. A time to love and a time absolutely to hate. Cling to what is good, hate what is evil. A time to war and a time for peace. What profit has a worker from that in which he labors? There's a time for everything. I'm, I'm promise I'm concluding. I just want to get to a certain verse. I have seen God given task with which the son of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from the beginning. If Satan can pollute your heart, guard your heart above all things for everything that you do will flow from it. If Satan gets to your heart, he gets to your eternity, right? If we could do a little Bible study in their hearts, except that no one find out the work that God does from the beginning to end. I know that nothing is better for them than to rejoice and to do good in their lives. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. God does want you to enjoy your labor, but God does not want you to worship your labor. 14 and 15 and we're gone. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. Fear, it's not so much about fear. Fear means reverence. I'm going to give you NIV just so we don't get caught up on the fear because God does not expect us to fear him anymore. God expects us to be in so much relationship with him that we don't even desire to do anything. So I don't have to fear you because I'm walking in complete alignment with you. The fear was to stop people from being stupid and doing things contrary to God that, that, that they would be like, oh my gosh, no, I'm scared of what's going to happen. We're not under law, but under grace. We don't have to be scared. We can have confidence in knowing that we are loved. I know everything God does will endure forever. God does it so that people will fear him. It still says fear, but fear means um, reverence. How do you know, Robin? I know the theology behind it. You're just going to have to trust me and you can check it um, yourself because it, it means reverence. Whatever is already been, whatever has already been and what will be has been before and God will call the past to account. <sighs> 
but that's making your own interpretation. When I say I know the theology of it, I'm saying I know the theology of it. I just don't have it right here to prove it. But I've gone into the Greek and I've gone into the Hebrew and this is what the word actually means when we go back to its original translation. Anyone who knows me knows I do not say anything of my own self. I come out of this book. So if I didn't get it from here or my study, I didn't have it. He's in school for this. I am in ministry school, but I don't say, I don't need to tell y'all I'm in ministry school to confirm my ministry. I take what working on my life, technical difficulties, te te I take the anointing on my life seriously, and I am not going to give the people of God anything that is not straight out of this book or in alignment with the Holy Ghost. Anyways, fear equals reverence. Yes, in the Old Testament, fear was fear. But when we use fear being in the New Testament now, it's about reverence honoring God. And so there's that. We're about to leave. We're about to move on. Tech, tech, y'all caught it. Um, I'm thankful for everybody. Um, let me close on my point though. I know whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it that men should fear before him. That which has already been and what is to be has already been and God requires an account of the past. Everything is going as it should go. You just have to get to the place of believing. Jose, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I curse the very ground that you walk on. The Bible says that if anybody preached to you any doctrine opposite of the Lord Jesus, that you be cursed. I curse the very ground you walk on. I'm so sick of you. I don't know why you keep coming back. I'm sorry. Um, we're here. And I love you all. And I'm so happy that you're here with me. And I thank you guys for coming to Sunday service. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs> I, <laughs> I love you, Lord. Let's pray and go. I think I've said everything that needs to be said. Just a distraction for sure. Um, I believe I've said everything that that should be said. I, I believe I've done everything that needs to be done. My only goal was highlighting that everything else is meaningless. To stop worshiping idols and to get back to worshiping the God of your salvation. My point and my purpose today was to shift you from seeing into seeing the right thing, that thing being Jesus. Paul saw nothing more when his eyes opened. He went off of what he had already saw, which was Jesus. I want to provoke you to stand on the revelation of Jesus that you have had in your life and walk that thing out. Even when it's dark, even when you can't see, to stand on that revelation as Paul did, knowing that God is one day going to open your eyes. I want you to get to the place of loving each other and honoring your time here on earth because this time is grace to get you into alignment with God. I want to get you into the place of loving the Lord God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and everything that you are. Then by receiving that love and giving it back to him, that you are able to then go and love everybody else because you are a light in the dark world. You are the salt in a tasteless universe. And if the salt loses its flavor, what purpose do you serve? We've got to be different. I'm here to provoke you to be disruptive, not to to make up your own things or do something random, but to go against the grain of, of materials and tangible things and get back to real authentic faith. Get back to being Christians, believers. We could take the titles out of it. Let's just be believers. Let's just be lovers of the Lord Jesus. Being in connection with Christ, saving souls, being leaders, because that's what this is about. I touched on for a moment and we're leaving. I talked about how we're in a world of people who are seeking Jesus. The Bible says, how would they know without a preacher? Everybody doesn't preach on a stage. Everybody's not preaching here and preaching there. Preaching is spreading the gospel. How are they going to know if you aren't spreading it? And no one in this day and age wants to hear your lip service. I want to see what you can do. I have a lot of people come to me talking a good game, but baby, I'm watching you to see what you do. I'm challenging you by your actions, not your mouth. God doesn't care about the talk. God wants to know how you back it up. We live in a generation that wants to see people backing it up. So we walk authentically. We, we, we don't act perfect anymore. We don't try to hide it, but we also don't accept imperfections either. We bring them into God's presence. And as we go into the presence of God with our imperfections, we walk out of the presence of God perfect in every way. Not perfection of ourself, not righteousness of ourself, but we've given God what we are that we might receive what he is, which is perfect, fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. When people say we're made in the image of God, it's when we've became the new man. That's made in the image of God.
The image of God is not what you come out of the womb as. No, but you have access to that image. And that's a decision that you have to make for yourself. As we're leaving, it's a decision that you have to make to decide Christ above all. Christ over everybody. That's a decision. It's not going to be decided for you. It's going to be hard. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be complicated. Yeah. But that's because we're at war for our soul. I said the battle is over your mind. It's about your mind and the way that you think. The mind and the soul do a dance. When you give your life to Christ, your spirit is saved. But we are spirits having a human experience. So I gave my life to Christ. Now my spirit is saved. My spirit then starts doing the work to save my mind and my soul. And once my mind be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the closer my mind gets to Jesus, the easier it is to save my soul. And then I'm still in flesh. And come that day of redemption, we wait in eager expectation for the redemption of our bodies. Come that day of redemption, what the spirit has saved within the mind, has saved within the soul, will then save my body. It's a war for the soul. The devil knows that if you ever lose your faith and change your worship from God to him, you've lost your spirit, which can't save your soul. Now you've lost your soul, which can't save your body. And this is how the word of God gets veiled to people. This is why they're already perishing. Because when they had the opportunity, opportunity to be redeemed. They rejected redemption. And so now God has given them over to a debased mind, a carnal mind that is contrary to his word. I just want to spark something in you that says, I want my mind to be saved from being debased, a reprobate mind. I want to be saved from destruction and doom. I want to be saved. I don't want to just be saved from money or material things. I want to be saved from my peace. I want y'all to have rest for real. I want y'all to lay down at night and know what it feels like to have Jesus resting in and on you. And that comes by you changing the place of your focus. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you for being a mighty God. I thank you for being a strong God. Father, I pray that you have your way. Father, I need not get loud. I need not get rowdy. I need not get crazy. I just ask that you bind every idol. Father, I can make it like this. If we don't bring it to you, don't take it from us. I don't want it to be easy. You said if your people who are called your name by your name will humble themselves and pray to you, that you'll hear them and you'll respond from heaven. God, I want you to respond, but not unless they cry out and pray. God, if we are not willing to bring every ounce of our inadequacy, every ounce of our uncertainty, every ounce of our worship, even against idols, into your presence and repent. God, if we're not able to open our mouth and say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me for giving to others what is due to you. If we are not able to come with that heart posture, God, do nothing for us. I do not pray for people who just came for a prayer for prosperity. No, I cancel those spirits, God. I pray instead for people who desire purpose. I pray for people who desire some meaning in this meaningless life, and that meaning only comes from you. I pray over people who are seeking a deeper revelation of who you are. I pray over people who are seeking a deeper relationship with you, Jesus. I come up against false facades and fakes. I come up against party favors and shaking our tail feathers, expecting a dollar. I come up against false ideologies and witchcraft, every contrary form of doctrine. I come up against false preachers. I come up against false teachers, false prophets, and every false anointing. As far as my anointing can go, I come up against it. I ask that you rebuke the devourer, oh God, and place a fresh hedge of protection around your people. I ask that you give us a fresh faith, a faith that is not built on what you do, but a faith that's built on who you are, that even when it looks like you're doing nothing, we can have faith to know that help is on the way, just as Saul did in his transition to become Paul. Father, I pray that we're able to let go of our Saul identity to attain our Paul identity and walk forward in our Paul. Father, I pray against every spirit that would convince us to believe that when we're wrestling against the dichotomy of the two identities, that it does not put us into a prison, but we understand that they seem opposite, but they're connecting for a reason because you need the darkness to shine your light. Oh God, I thank you for the connectivity of tissue that lies within
in your glory. Oh God, I'm thankful that you're purposeful. God, I'm thankful that you've kept us on this fast. I'm thankful for every person that you've kept in their mind and their heart and in their soul. Every person who fasted, even un not connected to me. Father, I'm thankful for how you keep our mind. Father, I'm thankful for the strength that, will, that lies within your spirit, oh God, that courses throughout our veins. God, I'm thankful that you've given us the power of life and death in our tongue. So when my hands are tied behind my back, I never needed them in the first place because the power was in what I say. I begin, I pray that we begin to speak life into every dead situation. I pray that we begin to speak increase into every area that we're lacking, oh God. I pray that we begin to speak faith into every area of doubt and unbelief, power into the place of every weakness, wholeness into the place that we're broken, oh God. Healing into the place of sickness that we can get out of operating in flesh and walking in this world as humans, as debased carnal creatures, sinful in nature, and that we can latch a hold of your righteousness, the Lord, our righteousness, Jehovah, sit canoe, that we can latch a hold of you who's higher, you who's greater, you who's better, Adonai, oh God, Abba, we call you Father Jesus, we call you as simple as possible, we don't have to have a deep theological understanding about Christology and who you are, but one thing that we must know is the name of the Lord Jesus, because it's only at that name that life is given meaning. Father, I pray that we begin to declare your name into spaces that are absent of it. I pray that we stop trying to fit in and become bold enough to stand out intentionally. Father, I pray over every believer that their faith be shifted away from prosperity and material and be shifted back into purpose. Your purpose, your purpose, the saving of our souls, oh God. We were sent here to save souls, oh God. Many are called, few are chosen. God, I'm thankful for the choosing. I'm thankful for the people that you've chosen to do your good work, the people that you've given great pain to, but it's only an indication of great purpose. God, I'm thankful, Father, for what it is that you're producing in us. I decree and declare as your word does say that we shall live to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I pray that we come into the revelation and understanding that greater are you in us than he that is in the world. I pray that we come to the place not rejoicing in power, but that me because that means nothing. Power means nothing if we are not rejoicing in the fact that our names are written in the book of life. God, I pray that the eyes of our understanding be open, not that we can make better decisions in to success, though that too. Not that we can wake up and be disciplined in our routine for success, though that too. But God, that we can wake up every day and align with the salvation that has aligned with us. For you loved us while we were yet still sinners, that we might become righteous by your glory. Father, I pray that we begin to focus on your glory. I pray over every single prophet, apostle, anointed person. I pray over every single seer and, and dreamer. I pray over every single person in warfare. I pray over every single person in bondage. I pray over every single person in expectation. I pray that you give us a fresh hope for our tomorrow and a fresh faith to sustain us right now. God, I pray that we stop being so focused on what's to come, that we aren't fully present in what we're experiencing today, but that we will get to the place of being ten toes down and what we're, what's happening around us now, what's going on around us now, that we don't miss out on the lesson, that we don't miss out on the glory, that we don't miss out on the love that we're meant to give unto people. God, if we don't give the love, who's going to do it because we're in a hateful world. God, if we don't shine the light, who's going to shine it because we're in a dark world? So God, I bring before you your people even now. Father, you said that if you be lifted up, you'll draw all into you and I help you with the lifting. I lift them up higher even now to your glory, high above insecurity, high above doubt, high above worry, high above anxiety, high above frustration, high above false worship, high above false ideologies, high above every weapon of warfare that is coming up against their purpose. I come up against arguing spirits and carnal battles for as Christians, as believers, our weapons are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. So as far as my, my purpose can go, God, I cast down every stronghold working against the people that are connected to me. For you said that the oil flows onto the head, down to the beards and to the ends of the garments. Father, I pray that your oil flow from your, from your head onto my head, to everything connected to me, that I'm thankful that you said the oil won't just be enough, but that it'll run over. So Father, I thank you for a running over type of blessing. God, you already know we need things tangibly. God, you already know we need things to support our carnal nature. But God, let not our need triumph over our desire to seek after you. God, I come up against anything that will stand in the way of our worship, anything that will come in the way of our sacrifice. For you said to present our bodies as a living sacrifice. 
You didn't ask for our money. You didn't ask for our behaviors. You said our bodies, then that you would do the rest. Father, I come up against the burden of overthinking that is weighing down believers today. This burden of trying to figure it all out. This burden of trying to perfect it. This burden of trying to walk in a straight line. When I heard the Bible say that you're leading us in the path of righteousness for your name's sake, we're not leading ourselves. We find failure when we're leading ourselves. So I speak life over every leader and death over every misunderstanding that they must leave their, lead their life themselves. God, I pray that they move out the way that you may come in the way. God, I pray that they let go of themselves, that they might attain who you are in them. Father, I pray that we begin to see the world differently. I pray that we begin to show up in the world differently. I pray that we begin to walk and talk differently and stop expecting from the world what it is that we're supposed to give it. We get mad at people who don't love us, God. We get mad at people who talk about us, Father. We get mad at people who curse us. But I heard the Bible say to bless those that curse you, love those that hate you. I heard the Bible say do for people who won't even do for you because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that the very people who crucified you, Jesus, you died for. So I'm thankful, Jesus, for restoration that lies in your glory. I'm thankful for redemption that lies in your spirit. I'm thankful for breakthrough that lies in your presence, God. I don't need the therapy. I just need a touch from you, Jesus. God, we don't need the psychology. We just need a touch from you, Jesus. Lord, I don't need a, I don't, I don't need the money. I don't need to take a vacation. God, what I need is, is a touch. Because if I'm the same person going to a new place, I'll be pulling the same demons into a new atmosphere. But oh God, if we can get a touch from you that changes us out of our old into our new, we can step fully into a new place, into a new space as a new person. Prepare for your glory. God, send your glory like a mighty rushing wind. Send your glory like a mighty rain, Jesus. Water every dry place in our life. Oh God, every area that we planted seed, Jesus. Let your glory fall from the sky and water it, oh God, that we may sprout above ground. You said you prepare a table for us that every hater, every adversary, every demon that thought it wouldn't be possible will have to eat their very words because you're going to show them how great and mighty you are. God, I'm thankful that you're a God that likes to show off. God, vindicate us boldly. God, vindicate us strongly. God, do it with a little bit of swag. Do it with a little bit of pizzazz. Jesus, you cursed the tree because it wouldn't bear you fruit. I know I'm just like you. So Jesus, do it with a little bit of sprinkle, sprinkle, as they say. Jesus, have your way. God, have your way in our minds. God, have your way in our hearts. God, have your way in our Faith, Jesus, I command faith to increase, Jesus, that we can get back into alignment with your spirit and your glory and out of alignment with every Beelzebub, every ball, every serpent, every wicked and witchcraft spirit, every false leader that we're following, I cast them down now, Jesus. Everyone that's operating in falsity but using your name just to profit off the lives of people. Cursed shall they be. This is your word, oh God. I pray curses over every single demon working against your children, oh God. Set them free from bondage. Set them free from internal bondage. Set them free from in in expired ways of thinking and inspire new ones. Jesus, break every chain. Break every yoke of the enemy. Break every fetter, oh God, that we can walk forward in absolute freedom and complete freedom and indisputable without argument of freedom that we can taste, touch, sense, and see and feel a bold type of freedom that no matter how yesterday comes and tries to snatch us back, we're too far in our tomorrow. We're standing firm in our today, pressing forward, always abounding in the work of the Lord. God, I pray that you set us on a new path right now today. I pray that this conclusion not really be an ending, but a beginning. Yes, it be the ending of this life. Yes, it be the ending of this fast, fast, but oh God, let it be a beginning to our next Jesus. That next not being something that we can comprehend with our eyes, but something that you've placed within our heart, the eternity that you've placed within our heart, the purpose that you've placed within our heart, the instinct that you've placed within our heart, that we can get to the place of loving each other as you have loved us, learning how to love ourselves, that we can fulfill the second commandment. God, I thank you. I thank you because I understand that it's already done. You said, ask and I shall receive, seek and I shall find, knock and the door shall be open. 
open unto you. So Jesus, I thank you for open doors in this season of our life. God, I thank you for every portal of expansion that you've opened. Yes, we can't worship success, but God, I'm thankful that you're giving it to us anyways. I heard the Bible say that the sinner has to worship success, but the salvation person, the one in salvation, the saint, has to only worship you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, then you'll supply everything else. So God, I'm thankful that you're a God of supply, supplying all of our needs according to your riches and glory. Some of us don't need material, tangible things. It's not even money. Some of us just need the people. Some of us just need the peace. Some of us just need the vision. Some of us just need the confidence. God, give us what only you can. Some of us need healing and breakthrough and deliverance, signs, wonders, and miracles in our own mind. Jesus, let us get back to being believers in you, not just some fake, cheap beings, oh God, aimed at just getting something that shall fade away. But oh God, let's go after what's actually rich, what carries on forever, which is the building of our inward man. Though the outward man may perish, yeah, we may have to go through a couple things, God. We may, we may have to lose a couple things and it may be uncomfortable. Oh God, but we're being built up every single day. That when we leave this God forsaken planet, Jesus, when hell is running amok and you're raining fire down from heaven on this place, we can trust that everything that we've done here it won't be our ending. It won't be it for us, but we'll have a beginning in eternity. You said your father's house has many mansions. I know that if everything that I have here fades away, that I've got a home in heaven for me. I know that if, if I lose everything here, that I've got abundance of resources in heaven. So God, I refuse to let us fall to what isn't really ours. But to what is only temporary and fading away, God, I thank you for the building of the inward man. God, I thank you for your grace on our lives. God, I thank you for your glory on our lives. God, I thank you for your spirit that dwelleth within us. God, you could have given us anything. You could give us riches and we worship you for riches. God, you can give us power and we thank you for your power. But, oh God, you've given us your spirit to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm us that whatsoever we bind on earth shall also be bound in heaven that if we decree a thing it shall be established you've given us your spirit to walk in righteousness you've given us your spirit to walk in holiness you've given us your spirit to keep us from the destruction of the enemy you've given us your spirit to counsel us you've given us your spirit to teach us you've given us your spirit to tell us every good and perfect thing of your will you've given Given us, given, given, given. It wasn't earned, it was given. It was a gift. The gift of God is eternal life. So God, I'm thankful that you just give us gifts that we could never work for. I'm thankful that you just give us gifts that we can never earn, God. They're just given. And so I'm thankful for your giving hand on today. Jesus, we laid out everything that we have before you, oh God. And we welcome you into our lives afresh for the new believer, for the person that doesn't even understand this moment, God. We welcome you in your fullness, Jesus, because there's nobody like you, Lord. I've searched high and low, and I found nobody to be like you, Lord. Alcohol can't be like you. Drinking can't be like you. Anything that we've done, we've come to find it can't be like you. So we're desiring more in our spirit. We're yearning for more within our soul. It's not childhood trauma. It's lack of Jesus. It's not PTSD. It's lack of Jesus. It's not really heartbreak. It's just lack of Jesus. It's not really cancer. It's just lack of Jesus. It's not depression. It's just lack of Jesus. God, I'm bold enough to believe that if we can just get a touch from you, everything will be right. God, I'm closing, but I thank you, Jesus, because I know how good you are. God, I don't just worship you because of what I've learned. I've worshiped you because of what I know. People pretend to worship you every day from intellect. Worship is an instinct, Jesus. When you're really saved, it's an instinct to bow before your throne. Oh, God, so I thank you, Jesus, for your throne, God, that there's nobody like you, oh, God. That when our mother and father forsake us, that you'll be there for us, Jesus. That even through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to fear evil because you're with us. Your rod and your staff are comforting us. The Lord is my rock and my salvation. And whom shall I fear? The Lord is my sh the strength of my life. And whom shall I be afraid? When my enemies came against me, even my foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army encamped camp against me, in this I shall be confident. I'm thankful, Jesus, for who you are, oh God. That when we have no one, we have everyone in you. Jesus, you're a mother when we need you. El Shaddai, 
you're a father when we need you. Abba, and I thank you for being all things and changing not. I'm thankful that even when we're faithless, you're yet still faithful. I'm thankful that even when we're confused, you're still clarity. I'm thankful that even when we're lacking, you're still abundance. God, I'm thankful that you're everything. God, I'm thankful that we don't have to seek validation from people, but that you've already validated us. God, I'm thankful that you laid it out for us to succeed. What kind of God is that? That you will love us in our lack, that you would set us up for success in the midst of so much failure. God, I thank you. Jesus, I feel like every time we approach your throne, we're asking you for this and we're asking you for that. And God, I did it too because I'd be a fool to come into your presence and not ask you for something because we're absolutely in need and you know this. But I would be a dummy, an absolute fool to not thank you for just being good. God, if you don't do anything else, you've already done enough. Jesus, and I thank you. You've already done enough. Yet you keep on doing, yet you keep on revealing, yet you keep on showing yourself to be true. I say stand on one revelation, Paul stood on the one encounter that he had with you, but God, I'm thankful that you give us more. You're not a one-trick pony. You're not a one-time God. You're not a God of 15 seconds of fame. Heaven and earth shall absolutely pass away. The grass shall wither and the flowers shall fade, but the word of God shall stand for, and for forever. Your kingdom is of no end. So God, I thank you for your eternity. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you, Jesus. Lord, our love could never compare to the love that you have for us, but oh God, we love you, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, we call you all things. Jesus, the Christos, the anointed one, God, we call you by name, who we need you to be. We call you Jehovah Jireh for the areas we need provision. We call you Jehovah Rapha for the areas that we need healing. We call you Jehovah Gabor for the areas we need you to fight for us. We call you Jehovah Shalom for the areas we need peace. Oh, we call you Jehovah Nisi for the areas where we need you to stand for us. We call you everything. We call you Jehovah. We call you Jehovah because it's a connecting word to everything that we could ever possibly need. We call you our savior. We call you our redeemer. We call you our warrior. We call you our way maker. I heard the Bible say that you'll make paths in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. That we may know that you, the Lord, who call us by our name and the God of Israel. God, I'm thankful that you give us treasures of darkness and hidden riches in secret places. Saul becoming Paul knew it to be true that you had treasure for him in a dark place. Oh, God, sometimes we pray against the darkness, not understanding the only way to get the treasure is to go through it. God, I thank you. I'm thankful for redemption. Oh, God, you said not to be prideful, to be soberly minded. Only think of, of ourselves within the measure of faith that you've given us. God, I do think I'm better than unbelievers. <laughs> and that's my faith. <laughs> that's my faith. You said that. So I do. And I thank you that I can walk around with my chin up and my chest out. Not in material things, not in, not in what's in my hand, but what we've been given in our heart. God, I pray that we get to the place of honoring and understanding the richness of what you've given us on the inside. Oh, that we are so successful and we don't need material things to prove that, that we are so prosperous and we don't need money to show that. Oh God, the money is only an indication of what we already got on the inside. And even if it doesn't, it's not an, it's not a, what's the word? Contradiction. Cause the money never validated us. God, I'm leaving. I'm closing Jesus, but I love you. And I thank you for every open door that you place before us. I pray that you give us the mental dexterity necessary to walk through these doors. I pray that you give us every strategy necessary to be builders in this season. Lord, I love you and I thank you. I plead the blood of Jesus over every single person connected to me from the crown of their head to the very soles of their feet. I pray, amen. Listen, y'all, we're leaving. May the Lord bless and keep you and cause his face to smile upon you. Love you too, Rich Off here. 
A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near you. I don't think y'all are hearing the Bible. If I could have a moment, just for a minute, we'll leave. We'll be dignified in a moment. All I did was hear the Bible say that a thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. They that dwell at the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God and him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Surely he shall deliver you. And from the perilous pestilence, he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings. You shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrow that flies by day. I have not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind, nor of the pestilence that walks in the darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it won't come near you. If you read your Bible, you will come to find out that the heart of a wise man is in his right hand. 10,000 at your right hand means no matter what comes your way, no matter what you endure, no matter what you experience, it is not going to mess up your eternity because it's in your heart which is in your right hand. It won't come near you, only with your eyes when you look and see the destruction of the wicked, only with your eyes. So if you're only living by what you see, you'll only see failure, you'll only see destruction. You've gotta live by what you believe, and I believe my God to be good. I believe my God to supply every need. I believe him to be that. I believe him. But it says that only these things happen. Only with your eyes will you look and see the destruction of the wicked because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Because you stopped worshiping false idols. Because you stopped worshiping false gods. God says, I'll cover you for the rest. This is not a season of working. Though it is, don't miss up my words. This is a season of walking. Walking is yet working. You've got to move each foot, but it's a season of walking. You're going to walk into it. Paul became because he was walking. He walked right into it. All you've got to do is walk. Just keep on walking. Trust that he is a prepare he has already prepared a place for you. All you got to do is sit down. But you're only going to recognize the place if you're in alignment with the God that created it. You can't get there by worshiping false idols. You can't get there by worshiping false gods. You gotta get there by serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know who they try to say God is, but God is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you take every day one step at a time and you just move your little bit of feet, one step after the other, one step after the other, you will come to find that every step was ordered, that all things really do work for the good of those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. That in due season, you will reap if you faint not. We talked about seasons and times. In due season, I wish I could say it will happen tomorrow. If you turn around three times, it's going to be in you. It's going to happen tomorrow and be in your bank account tomorrow. No, but in due season, you will reap. Due season, faith is proven in the due season, not in the reaping. In the due season, faith isn't proven in the redemption. Faith is proven that you might be redeemed. Hallelujah. You got a hallelujah. You have to prove your faith. In due season, all you got to do is walk. All you got to do is walk. Take it one step at a time and walk. I don't care what people say about you. I don't care what this world throws at you. You know you're purposeful by how much pain comes. But wait, you know how effective you are by how many haters you have. I don't care what people say about you. You just keep moving forward. I don't care what they think about you. Y'all don't know. I've been on, and this ain't to say it like that. I'm, mo I'm going. You can take it however you want to take it. I've been on the screen at the Potter's House, on the national broadcast, on YouTube. I've been there broke. I've been there and looking messed up, no haircut, wearing the same outfits. I've been there. Why? Because I cared more about Jesus than I cared about anybody else. To this day, I go up to that altar no matter what because I care about Jesus. Do you care about Jesus enough to turn away from everybody else, what they think about you, how they feel, and to be the standard, to be the standard of faith? Who's going to be the standard of faith? Yeah, we got the standard of influence. Everybody wants to look like Keisha and Shamika, or let me come down your row. Everyone wants to look like Karen and Jacob, or, or, or I don't know every name, whatever name goes down your row. Who's going to be the standard of faith? To say, listen, y'all gonna have to come up to my belief system. I'm not going down to yours. Listen, I'm done. I ain't got nothing else to say to y'all. Y'all, I done gave y'all all I got. Now my voice gonna be messed up.
but the Lord shall restore me. <laughs> We're humans, but people know blow their nose. It is what it is. If you want to join my Discord, it's called Ascension. Ascension, if you look at the Bible, it's Mark chapter 16 is what promoted the name, provoked the name. Um, it's when Jesus went high and was seated at the right hand of, G at the, of the Father. The Ascension, I love you too, Casey. So the name is Ascension. It's about going higher together. It's believers, it's disruptors, it's world impactors. I love you too, Strong Complex. If you want to join that discord, that community, this movement, the movement is Ascension. You'll be hearing more about it soon. You can click the link in my bio. It says join a small group. I'm going to change the name. I am Today is the last day to do one-on-ones. I am taking the link down in one hour. No, 10 minutes. I'm taking it down. I love you too. I have people reaching out. I ain't going to tell y'all because I ain't doing that, but y'all done lost y'all mind. I am not doing no more one-on-ones. <laughs> if you want a one-on-one, -on -one, babe, you're going to have to contact me personally and I'm going to have to pray about it because I'm not doing them like that anymore. But if you want to join the movement, I encourage you. Casey said, please join. It's such a beautiful community. Um, shout out to everyone who's in the community. I love you too, Christopher. Shout out to everyone who's in the community who did this seven-day fast with me. This is Sunday service for y'all, but this is the conclusion of our fast for them. Too bad Chick-fil-A is closed on a Sunday. I think that's because I need deliverance from Chick-fil-A. Uh, <laughs> not to doubt 50 it is right. I surely did. <laughs> I love you too, Bree. I just tried to join the Discord, but it won't let me. Um, is it two different Discords? It's one Discord. If one link doesn't work, I know the small group should work, the entrepreneurship one. If both of them don't work, pray for me and I'll send you the link. But they should work. They should absolutely work. Actually, I could try right now while we on here. I could just give it to you while the getting's good. But shout out to every single person that endured. Do you keep the feasts that are coming up next week, brother? No, I don't. Not me personally. Um, Shout out to you guys. I made it so very clear that as we embarked on this fast, that it was going to be something that was um, about getting closer to God. It was not about trying to get anything from God, but to get connected to him and get in alignment with him for this quarter for a Why am I crying? Because God is good. And sometimes tears are the only way that I can express what's going on on the inside of me, which is his glory. They ask why we dance and why we shout in Pentecostal cultures. It's because sometimes my feet are able to say what my words can't quite communicate. I'm trying to communicate a spiritual thing from a carnal place. And the only thing that I can do is shed a couple of tears. The only thing I can do is start moving my feet sometimes. I'm crying because God is good. I'm crying because as I sow into cheers, I reap in joy. So Sometimes I like to water the ground of every seed that I've planted that I might be given um, joy from those seeds. That's why I'm crying, because God is good. Am I Pentecostal? I'm non-denominational, but I, I do, I, I, I abide by the similar stuff. Anyways, the Discord. Okay, yeah, it worked for me. If you click the one that says small groups, it'll work for sure. I'm already seeing new people. Keep joining. We love you. That is awesome. Um, so I'm excited for you guys um, and what we have planned. We had this private group chat for the fast and we've been talking about, we've been chit chatting up in this private group chat. I'm closing the private group chat so that we can all start talking to the group chat. Cause even I've been in the group, the, the private chat and not talking in the group chat. So we're going to have to do something about that so we can be in the group chat. <laughs> and so, yeah, anyways, there's that. Um, the link is in my bio for it. Uh, what else is there? Yeah, I don't think I have anything else. No, keep the fast chat. I thought about it because we are connected so good. But shoot, it was people that wasn't even talking anyways. Nevertheless, um, Shy is good. I love y'all and I love this movement. Um, it's for the generations. I feel like it is so needed. I want to fellowship more. Join the Discord. This is not just... We do be lit in there, for real. It is not just... All right, we'll keep the chat. This is not just for... Um, it's not just a discord to just text each other. This is something that's aimed at us getting together in, um, y'all be asking people what they go. I don't call on to y'all little schemes now. Y'all just be asking people what they go to versus to distract them. But, um, it's to eventually meet up in person and to grow. Shout out to BK. It wasn't working for me until I downloaded the app. So downloaded it first. Okay. Um, I'm gonna put the, I'm gonna, I'm gonna redo it just to make sure everything is good. And I'm gonna change my link tree anyway. So it'll say Ascension and join the community. Um, essentially, like I said, it's about this generation getting closer to God and going higher together. We want to go higher in the world. Uh, how can I fellowship more? 
we go we go higher in the world. I'm done reading comments. I'm about to go. We go higher in the world, and that's good. But we got to go higher in the word. We got to go higher. So are these lives on the subscription TikTok? I don't really do that. Um, I have no reason for that because it stops other people from reaching it who need it. Now, if you want to go the extra mile, shout out to the subscribing, but I never say subscribe. If you want to financially support my ministry, you can do that by clicking the link in my bio. But it really, I just want y'all to connect with me and you can do that by joining my Discord. I don't do private lives because that would require everybody needing to pay for something. And I am not doing ministry for pay. I'm doing ministry for the betterment of the kingdom. So I don't want to offer something that only people who pay for it can access it. Yet, We'll talk about different stuff that's going to happen through Ascension at another time, because that, of course, will be different. Um, and so shout out to you, Trend Ben, for joining. Where's the Discord? Link in bio, link in bio. The replay of this live will be posted on my YouTube. Link in bio, link in bio. Robin, what's your YouTube? At the Robin Boynton. The Bible said that it's a sin. What are you talking about? But um, link in bio, at the Robin Boynton everywhere. Um, I think that's about it. I want to give a shout out to the people that have stuck with me for a very long time. One of those people being Christopher Malone. Um, he said something the other day that blew my mind. Like, I know you've been with me for a minute, but I ain't know. Him. Okay. And so shout out to that. Shout out to everyone who's sticking and staying with me. I do not desire to connect with anybody that I won't walk with forever. Now, we do have to abide by God's timing. God doesn't ordain and anoint us to be together forever. But as long as he has ordained and anointed us to be together forever, um, then that's what we're going to do. And so I praise God for everyone that he connects me to. And I love you guys. Um, shout out to everyone who's coming into partnership with me um, and to be leaders in these type of spaces. I want everyone's gifts, talents, and anointings to be able to shine from a place of strategy and structure, of course. Um, you know, if uh, it, it, lights aren't noticed, if every light is shining at the same time, I believe God's gift deserves its own time to shine. And so... Um, if you need your own business, join the Discord. We'll be doing business communities also and all that good, great stuff. And so um, I don't know where I was going with it, but I know where I am. I'm grateful for every single one of you. Casey, grateful for you. Um, Amy, I'm grateful for you. Um, I'm grateful for all of y'all. I just don't want to start naming names and y'all be like, why didn't he say my name? Hey, I can't name everybody now, but you know that you are appreciated and you're valued. Ice lovers, I love you so much, you know? Um... All you have to do is click the link in my bio and you can join from there. And that'll be great. And I look forward to seeing you guys soon. If you guys have um, anything that God has on your heart, I love you too. We're leaving. I love you too, Maddie. If you guys have anything on your heart um, for me, need my own home. Good, 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 good. I've already prayed for everyone connected to me. So if you're connected to me, you got the prayer, whether you're in the live or not. Link is giving an error message. Try downloading Discord first and going from there. Also, my my security on the Discord is at the maximum level. So some of you may be getting errors because of your account. I didn't even think about that. I do not want bots. I do not want spam. I'm I'm quick with the block. Until I get somebody to do to be me and I don't have to be the person doing it all. You know what I'm saying? I, me, and I'm be blocking people. You know what I'm saying? Because I want that um, community to be, I just want the community to be good. So you have to have a phone number and your Discord has to be active for 10 minutes. I believe it's 10 minutes or maybe 30, but I think just 10. You have to have a phone number. Your account has to be verified and then it has to be active for 10 minutes and then you'll be able to get in. So try downloading it. And then if you really want to join for real, Y'all know how to find my page and it'll be right linked in my bio and you can get to it. Um, if you really want to go there, if you really want to get to it, y'all can check back the, on the page in 10 minutes. I'm about to put a new link up as soon as we get off here. I don't have anything else for y'all. I look forward to connecting with y'all. I look forward to fellowshipping with y'all. I look forward to growing and building with y'all. I love you, Junior Mike. I look forward to whatever God has for you. I may not be able to see it with my physical eyes, but I'm always watching you in the spirit as far as I can go. So there goes that. Hey, Jasmine, Flower Bomb Jay, girl, you ain't show up for church today, huh? You, you ain't show up for church today. I saved your seat and everything. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm done, y'all. I'm leaving. That's it. I love you. And I'll check up. I'll just join the Discord. Yay. That's awesome. Um, I'll catch up with y'all later. Have a great rest of your Sunday. Please lift me up in prayer. Done. Bye. Bye, 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 bye. No, don't be sad. Just join the Discord. Y'all don't ever have to be sad about me leaving if you join the Discord. I love you. Bye.